Before games like Gothic 1 and 2, the Elder Scrolls games, Skyrim, Oblivion, Morrowind, Daggerfall, and even Arena, there was Ultima 7 The Black Gate. Released in 1992 by Origin Systems and published by the much beloved and well respected Electronic Arts, Ultima 7 was the start of a new trilogy of Ultima games labeled The Age of Armageddon and was a huge evolution over previous titles. While previous Ultima games had a small window showing the game world with a user interface surrounding it, Ultima 7 uses every pixel to display graphical assets with full mouse support. The game was so advanced for its time that it was apparently a frustrating experience just to get it running. I've heard of cases of having to mess with something called EMS and having to create a boot disk. Luckily for me, I played Ultima 7 back in the day with the CD version, so to this day, I have no idea what those two things even are, and I like to keep it that way. That's not to say I had no issues though. In fact, I remember the Blackgate running way, way too fast on our Pentium computer. I was very ignorant on computer hardware back then, but I later found out that our PC was just way too powerful for the Blackgate, and it required a program to get it running the way it should. Now, as a kid with no internet, I was pretty much forced to play the game in Sonic the Hedgehog mode, but you know what? It didn't stop me from playing the Black Gate at all. The game was just that good. Just like in every Ultima game, at least in Ultimas 5 and 6 as well as the spin-offs, you assume the role of the Avatar, a paragon of the Eight Virtues, and hero to the land of Britannia. The Virtues are split up into the three principles of truth, love, and courage that when combined together, form the Eight Virtues of Honesty, Compassion, Valor, Justice, Sacrifice, Honor, Spirituality, and Humility. So basically you're playing the ultimate good guy, or girl, depending on your gender. The Avatar is meant not only to be the savior and protector of Britannia, but also to be a shining example for others to follow. Up to the Black Gate, the Avatar was known for being the slayer of Mondane, Minax, and Exodus back when he was known as the Stranger in Ultimas 1, 2, and 3 respectively. In Ultima 4, with no great evil to fight other than what's in ourselves, Lord British decreed a quest for the Avatar in which the Stranger ended up undergoing many trials with him attaining Avatarhood. He would later return in Ultima V to save the land from Lord Blackthorn and the Shadow Lords, as well as forging a peace with the Britannians and Gargoyles in Ultima VI. So needless to say, the Avatar has quite a bit of star power in Britannia, at least to those who recognize him, and at this point has been raised to near mythical levels in history. Ultima VII is widely regarded by fans to be the best game in the series, with even Richard Garriott calling it the most masterfully executed Ultima game. Ultima VII blew my young kid mind back in the day with its game mechanics that were completely foreign to me. Things like a day and night cycle, fully fleshed out NPCs with unique personalities and schedules to keep, animations for sitting in chairs and sleeping in beds, drawing water from a well. Baking bread. Spinning wool to make thread. So you can use that thread on a loom to make cloth, which you could then cut into bandages the need to feed yourself and your companions, a lighting system in which you're required to use a light source in order to navigate in the dark, painting, playing musical instruments, as well as many monsters and villains to slay, many weapons and armor to collect, both regular and magical, and a fully explorable world with various methods of travel, with the freedom to move in any direction you wish. While this may not seem absolutely amazing today, considering it's been over 30 years since Ultima 7 released, the fact that we had a PC game like Ultima 7 in 1992 is unreal. While I did dabble in a computer game here and there back then, I was primarily playing on the Sega Genesis. And the only other game I played that could be remotely similar to Ultima 7 was Shadowrun for the Sega Genesis. Other than that, I was playing games like Landstalker, Fantasy Star 4, and the Streets of Rage games. So going from games like those to something as open and free as Ultima 7 was such a huge jump for me. And honestly, I felt out of my element being thrust into a world that already had established characters and a long-running story since before I was even born. And a lot of these things just went completely over my head. The Ultima series had a pretty long run even up to Ultima 7, and to this day, I still consider it to be my favorite computer role-playing game of all time. I tend to replay Ultima 7 every year or so, and I just recently finished a playthrough, so this video is going to be me putting out almost every thought I have about this game out there on the internet. So basically, there's going to be a lot of spoilers, so if you're all interested in playing this game, I highly suggest you grab a digital copy of Ultima 7 somehow and playing it through the Exalt engine. So with all that said, let's begin by stepping into the Moon Gate.
Avatar! Know that Britannia has entered into a new age of enlightenment. Know that the time has finally come for the one true Lord of Britannia to take his place at the head of his people. Under my guidance, Britannia will flourish, and all of the people shall rejoice and pay homage to their new guardian. Know that you too shall kneel before me, Avatar. You too will soon acknowledge my authority. For I shall be your companion, your provider, and your master. <laughs> That right there was The Guardian, the Avatar's new nemesis, and honestly, after playing the previous Ultima games, I still find him to be an effective and compelling villain. The intro ends with you stepping into the Red Moon Gate, then you're thrust into the main menu screen so you can create your Avatar, and here's where the game kinda goes a step backwards compared to previous entries. For example, where's the Gypsy character creation? You know, those series of virtue conflicts that sets up your stats and class? And why is there only one portrait per gender now? There were six in the previous game. Seriously, when I finally played Ultima 6, I was very surprised to see the variety of portraits you could choose. I suppose they just didn't have the time to draw different paper dolls for the Avatar. And as far as the Gypsy goes, there is an in-game reason as to why that is. Basically, Magic is leaving Britannia, and as a result, the Gypsies are low in number nowadays. After you choose your name and gender, the game starts off in the city of Trinzic. 200 Britannian years have passed since your last visit, and you're joined by a longtime friend and companion, Yolo. You find out through him that magic is ebbing away from the world of Britannia, causing the mages to go quite loony. And there's been a pretty nasty ritualistic murder in the city, which you're tasked by the mayor of solving. And when I say nasty, I mean it. This scene was pretty gory even by today's standards. The mayor tells you to explore the town, talk to the townspeople, and find out any leads on who killed the blacksmith Christopher and the gargoyle Inamo. You're joined later on by the victim's teenage son, Spark, who desires vengeance against the man who did the deed. A man with a hook for a hand accompanied by a wingless gargoyle. You can decide not to bring him along, but I do because he's easily the best party member in this game. You're pretty much quarantined and trenching until you can get enough evidence for the mayor to continue your investigation. I suppose you could call this the game's tutorial section, even though it's pretty much part of the main storyline. It's basically the developers getting you used to the interface and branching dialogues as well as encouraging you to explore as much as you can. I find it pretty effective. I mean, a murder mystery? Who doesn't love being a detective? Once you get the password to leave Trinzic, though, I have to confess that back in the day, I made no effort to continue the main storyline. Ultima 7 was a lot like Oblivion and Skyrim back in the day, in the fact that you could basically just go in any direction you wished. Seriously, after leaving Trinzic, you could go south and just hit up a moon gate to various parts of Britannia if you really wanted to. I'd always hit up Britain and grab Shamino, another longtime friend and companion, then go to Castle British and read through Lord British's dialogue and grab some important items from him. Such as the Over the Moons, a ship deed from the Forge of Virtue add-on, and a spell book, though you have to hunt that down on your own. Kinda wish he would just give me the spell book, considering it doesn't really have that much in it, but that's what he's known for. I also like how it seems he's eternally facepalming when I reveal that I forgot to bring my own Orb of the Moons with me from the intro. And for those of you who don't know, the Orb of the Moons is what summons Red Moon Gates that allows travel between worlds, so for the Avatar to forget it is pretty dumb of him to put it lightly. After that, I go grab Dupre and Jellum and Yana and Cove, leaving my party no more than six members because they have to eat after all. And they go through food like nobody's business too. I always keep a full bag of meat on me and keep them stuffed as best I can per day and I promise I didn't write that on purpose. My memory is pretty fuzzy since it was almost 30 years ago, but I think I get as far as Minnock to witness another ritualistic murder scene, but after that I just go explore the land hoping to find something cool. This game really rewards exploration, from pirate caves housing loads of treasure like gold bars to clearing out a bandit camp in the deep woods of Yu. You can even visit the ruins of Stonegate from Ultima 5 and find a pretty neat sword that drains magic from spellcasters, provided you're patient enough to pathfind your way through the swamps. 
You could just not explore and just talk to NPCs and do the main storyline, or get into doing each city's side quest, but if you wanted to, the game rewards you with almost every step you take, and the game is far more immersive in its quest design. Since Ultima 7 is an old school computer role playing game, you don't have quest markers to point you to the next objective, and honestly, I feel that's how it should be. Nowadays, most modern games have quality of life features such as fast travel, an in-game journal, and a map telling you where to go, but this comes at a cost of not really being invested in the game world and a lack of immersion, with a focus on clearing out a checklist. Without all these, you feel far more invested in the story and characters, and the sense of reward is satisfying. Completing side quests, for example, don't give you any sort of pop-up with a sound effect saying you completed Lovebirds and Pirates or something like that, no. Instead, the side quest is closed with no fanfare. You might know that you gain experience points out of the deal, but that's if you bother opening up the character stat sheets. You could also go ahead and steal anything you find interesting from people's houses. You're really not supposed to, too, since you're the avatar, but I love how Origin tested the player's virtues even in a virtual gaming environment. If you steal too often, though, some of your companions will just outright leave you, so to get over that, you can just drag stuff into Yolo's bag or something. That way it's them stealing, not you. Honestly, though, I usually play a straight and narrow avatar nowadays. It sounds boring, but I really don't need all this stuff since I know where all the good treasure spots are. And it's nice to actually play a good guy for a change. You can bet that I was stealing stuff left and right as a kid, though. And I have to say, if I'm being picky on the game, it would have to be the game's combat system. It's heavily criticized. Ultima 7 moved away from the turn-based system in the last few entries in favor of real-time. You basically press the C button to start combat, combat unfolds automatically, whoever has the best weapons, armor, and stats wins. There's no input from the player at all besides what weapons you give to your party members and how you train them in NPCs, and maybe messing with the various different combat modes. Not to mention that the RPG mechanics themselves aren't very in-depth, though most Ultimate games are like that with the exception of the two Underworld games. And I have to say, and I promise I'm not saying this because I love the game so much, but I really don't have a problem with the combat system at all. The reason for that is that I'm just not really frustrated by it. The other reason is that the rest of Ultima 7 is so good. To me, if a combat is average or just plain bad, other systems in the game need to make up for it. And everything else that Ultima 7 does, it does an A plus job. That said, I wouldn't say no to a better combat system, of course. I figure with a game that's built this way, this was the best method they could come up with. The most rewarding thing about the combat is being able to loot bodies after you're done, as well as getting some experience points for yourself and your companions, so there's that at least. I'm also constantly amused by my companions' battle cries. I don't know why, but I just find them humorous. The only combat I really enjoyed from any Ultima game was Ultima Underworld 1 and 2. Ultima hasn't really been known for having great combat in the first place, and the strength of Ultima 7 lies in its exploration and living, breathing fantasy world. I will say though that looking back, the game world is pretty small. While everything is kind of packed in and condensed, I mean, it takes like a minute or so to go from one side of the world to the other. A lot of that has to do with the hardware limitations of the time. The game originally released on 8 5 and a quarter inch floppies on the DOS operating system. Sometimes I wonder just how big and more advanced this game would be if it came out as a Windows 95 game on a CD. Despite that though, there is plenty, plenty of exploration to do in the Black Gate, despite how condensed everything is. The game world is jam-packed with, I hate the word, content, so you're not hurting for exploration and quests to undertake. But anyways, before taking a stab at the main quest, I'll take the free boat from Lord British to go to the Isle of Fire to tackle the Forge of Virtue questline. For some reason, Lord British keeps the boat up in the city of Vesper to the northeast of Britain, so it's a bit of a hike. This guy really likes us to work for everything. The Isle of Fire is where the Avatar slew Exodus back in Ultima 3. It originally sunk beneath the ocean, but the various earthquakes and tremors throughout the land has caused it to rise from the sea. Here you find a blind mage named Erthian who has made this place his temporary home in order to study the dark core of Exodus, so naturally we're going to have to take care of Exodus again, much to Erthian's dismay. The Forge of Virtue add-on is one of the most fun and most rewarding expansion packs I have played in the history of computer games. Your task is to basically undergo the three tests of truth, love, and courage while finding a way to banish Exodus from Britannia. One of the tests requires you to forge a black rock sword and trap it with an evil demon inside it, which gives the Avatar a variety of powerful abilities such as restoring his magical reserves and killing almost any enemy in the game with one hit. But the most broken thing about the entire add-on is that finishing each test maxes the Avatar's stats. That's not all though. When you finally banish Exodus into the Void and complete the questline, Lord British gives you another 30 points to your strength. Good grief. That is one rewarding questline. I can't think of any other game in which you're given some pretty broken rewards, though to be fair this was back in the day with no online walkthroughs or anything like that, though some of the tests are pretty straightforward. I'm sure plenty of players manage this fine. 
and I can't continue without putting out a demonstration of using the Blackrock Sword against Lord Bridge, so here you go. I know you're all waiting for this. I feel like all of us Ultima players gave this a try back in the day. You can also try to kill him by double-clicking on a plaque in the courtyard, which is a reference to a real-life event that Richard Garriott went through. That is precisely the thing to do, Avatar. At this point, I have the entire castle on the island to myself, so I usually toss all of Earthian's garbage away and make it my personal home where I can decorate and store all my favorite loot for fun. Demon Sword lets me return here anytime I wish, and honestly, it is pretty comfy. I just wish I had a better quality bed, but the Avatar is used to Spartan living arrangements. Before moving on to the main quest though, I have to bring up the Ho of Destruction side quest. Basically, you meet a farmer named Mac in the city of Britain who tells a tale of a flying object that crashed on his farm, a Kilrathi starfighter. For those of you who don't know, this is a reference to Wing Commander, another origin game, and one that I haven't played unfortunately. Even though I haven't, I always thought this theme was neat. But anyways, he also mentions a hoe of destruction he's got in his shed. Basically, a mage was meant to fix a hoe for a farmer and a enchanted sword for a warrior. Considering that magic's messed up in Britannia, you can probably guess what happened. Mac mentions that he lost the key to his shed where the hoe is kept because he decided it'd be a great idea to use it as fish bait. It's worth mentioning because the hoe is one of the most powerful weapons in the game next to the Blackrock Sword and Death Scythe, and good luck getting the latter without any sort of guide. I always give this weapon to Yana due to the fact that she's a druid. Other than that, Spark is pretty good with it. Going back to the main quest though, when you finally get enough evidence to leave Trinzic, you find out that your main suspects are a man with a hook, a wingless gargoyle, and two senior fellowship leaders, Elizabeth and Abraham. A lot of your questing leaves you chasing their ship called the Crown Jewel, though they're always basically ahead of you no matter what. The guess of the main storyline is that the Guardian is using an organization called the Fellowship to brainwash most of its population, and to get them ready for his eventual conquering of Britannia. Instead of the Eight Virtues, the Fellowship teaches a philosophy based on the Triad of Inner Strength, which consists of striving for unity, trusting your brother, and being worthy before expecting a reward. It's actually a pretty successful organization too, and there are chapters in most major cities, with even Lord British giving them his full support after they've been shown to feed the poor, providing education, and promoting general goodwill and peace. Unfortunately, they're pretty much the bad guys in this game, and that's not even a spoiler because you find out really early on that two Fellowship leaders are on the very same ship that you're chasing. Due to the Fellowship's influence though, it's had a sad but intended side effect of people abandoning the Eight Virtues. Since the Avatar has been away for quite some time, the people turn to someone else to fill the void. That's someone being Batlin, one of the three founders of the Fellowship, the two others being Elizabeth and Abraham. Despite their influence though, on the surface it seems that Britannia is pretty peaceful. People are working their trade, socializing, and even Lord British talks about how it's secure in all quarters. Definitely a far cry from the constant threats Britannia faced in previous games. When you dig deeper though, you'll hear talks of a huge class divide in overall society, as well as the poor integration of gargoyles living amongst the humans. You find out that most of the gargoyles live in an island called Turf, and with some of them living in this desert city of Vesper. But the humans there outright hate them, so they usually have to keep them themselves on the west side of the city. I guess Britannians have pretty long memories. You can likely blame all this on the Fellowship though, since they have a huge influence across the lands of Britannia. You can't very well just put every Fellowship building on fire though, that'd be a pretty funny solution. The real solution is to meet the Time Lord who tells you that the Guardian had the Fellowship set up three generators around the world which is disrupting magic and the moon gates, which explains why the mages in the world have gone mad. Meeting the Time Lord is a quest unto itself where you have to do a lot of running around just to get an item to talk to the Wis who acquire a notebook from a sage before you're even allowed an audience. But it brings you to one of my favorite areas in the game, Scar Bray, and where your quest is to stop an evil undead lich and his growing army of the dead. One of my favorite things about it is that you need a seance spell just to be able to commune with the ferryman the dead inhabitant of the island. You basically have to come here and get the answers to the questions of life and death from the sage's notebook, which reveals startling details about the Fellowship's true purpose, even make a note of the Guardian himself. This unfortunately gets the poor guy killed when you go back to return the notebook to him, which is a shame. Hopefully it was quick. Your next step is the Generators, but one thing you really have to do is join the Fellowship by talking to Batlin in Britain. The main reason for that is because only Fellowship members are allowed on the island where one of the Generators is hidden. He basically tests you on a bunch of philosophical questions and does a really good job making you feel bad at any answer you give him, but after that you basically have to deliver a sealed box to another Fellowship member in Minnock, with clear instruction on not to open it, which I totally ignored. After that, he sends you to collect Fellowship funds from the dungeon to Star, which of course is filled with loads of monsters. 
Thankfully at this point of the story we're pretty damn strong, so they die quickly, but that's very suspicious. After all this, you're inducted into the fellowship in the evening and given your medallion, and this medallion will absolutely break the economy of the game. I don't really recommend this for your first playthrough, but if you wanted to, you can go straight to the House of Games on Buccaneer's Den, wear the fellowship amulet on the avatar, put 100 gold coins on each rat, and enjoy your free money because fellowship members in the House of Games gets a higher payout. So you always profit no matter what. Really, really handy if you want to fill out your spellbook quickly and buy loads of reagents. And it's totally not against the virtues either because even your companions encourage gambling. But anyways, once you finally manage to get around to destroying the generators, you'll find that magic finally works as it should, with the mages finally regaining their senses after so many years, as well as collecting the items that drop from the generators. The drawback now is that the moon gates have all been destroyed, leaving the Avatar Strand on Britannia, and that the Guardian is close to entering the world through a constructed black gate once the planets are aligned. One thing I do want to mention is that you can use the cube item from the cube generators to force the truth out of Fellowship members. I had fun with this thing back in the day. Some of these guys actually reveal some cool information, especially on the Fellowship member back in Trinzic, Clog, who secretly delighted in the death of Christopher. It's also here that you find out that Christopher was murdered for not really wanting to build the Black Gate pedestal so an evil god could cross through and conquer the world. And of course, I tried to use it on Batlin, but it didn't work. He just looks right through you and disappears in a comical fashion. And if you're thinking you can use the Black Rock Sword on him, forget it. The Guardian's influence protects him from the demon's powers, unfortunately. Funnily enough though, he can die if you cast the Death Bolt spell on him. I actually found that out as a kid. I don't really recommend doing that of course, but I think he shows up at the end of the game anyways, which is set on the Isle of the Avatar in the dungeon Hithloth. <laughs> <laughs> you and your party are super powerful now, so it's no trouble to fight through the hordes of monsters and fellowship soldiers. Except these liches, these guys are tough. They can cast Death Bolt on you, causing you to die in one hit. Well, I say die, but there's no death state in Ultima 7. You basically just wake up at the Fellowship Shelter and pause near Britain. Even the demon can't kill it, which really surprised me. Really? He's pretty scared of it too. What kind of demon is this? Well, Undead 1, Demon 0, I guess. Well, to get over on him, I use the Invisibility All spells, so he can't target you. He's basically your final roadblock before reaching the last encounter and where Batlin, Hook, Four Skis, and Elizabeth and Abraham are about ready to welcome the Guardian to Britannia. Stop the Avatar! I will come through the Black Gate now! Do not let him near! Fighting them is no trouble since my party members are practically killing machines. Seriously, it wasn't even a contest. I also didn't mention it yet, but when you die in the game, it's actually Elizabeth and Abraham that deliver you to the Paul shelter near Britain. If you happen to die during this encounter, they still bring you to the shelter, which is pretty damn funny. Actually, they still do so even if you do kill them. I don't know how that works, but there you go. At this point, you're ready to end the game by putting those items you got from the generators on the pedestals, with the Guardian taunting you about how if you destroy the Black Gate, you won't be able to return home, Avatar. Ah! 
Lo, Avatar, the moment of truth has come. You can destroy the Black Gate, but you will never return to your beloved Earth. Or you can come through now and go home. It is your choice. So he gives you the option of stepping through so you can go back to Earth, which triggers the game's bad ending, but we're the Avatar, so we blow up the Black Gate, barely putting a stop to the Guardian's mad plans for our beloved planet. I have to admit though, I enjoyed the story to this game as a kid, but once I found out that the whole story is basically EA bad, I sort of don't like it anymore. The generator is shaped like the EA symbols, the Guardian is a destroyer of worlds, origin slogan was we create worlds, Elizabeth and Abraham, E and A. Not to mention that the Fellowship is basically Scientology with Batlin having similarities to L. Ron Hubbard, the founder. It's definitely not because I like electronic arts or anything like that. I just prefer stories that are its own thing. I know stories are usually inspired by something like a myth or a real life event or a personal journey the writer went through or even some other piece of media. I just find it way too on the nose here that it kind of takes me out of the game, but it could just be me. A lot of it is because I thought everything here was so original back then, and I thought the Guardian was a pretty compelling villain. And once I read about the references, it kind of shattered the illusion. I don't hate it or anything, but it's something that's hard to ignore once you've read about it. There's just one more thing I want to talk about. I can't not bring up the fact that you can end the entire world with the Armageddon spell. Yes, that's right, you can end all life on the planet. Now I'm sure we've all seen Spoonie's Ultima 7 video, and pretty much every Ultima 7 fan knows what this spell does. But the fact that you can just cast this spell is crazy. Casting it requires you to be level 8 and have the 800 gold pieces just to buy this spell from the Mage Rudium. The spell itself causes an earthquake and a permanent storm which wipes out all life on the planet except you, Lord British, and Batlin for some reason. Talking to Batlin though really reveals a lot about him. He mentioned he journeyed to Scar Bray much as we did and wasn't really satisfied with Kane's answers to the questions of life and death, of which Kane had no answer to give. He ended up believing that there was no point to anything, no meanings, no virtues, no values. It's even mentioned a little in the game's manual, where Batlin mentioned that he made a pilgrimage to the ruins of Scar Bray and had a spiritual experience so profound that he never revealed to anyone. It explains a lot why he ended up becoming the leader of the Fellowship and allying with the Guardian. And despite what I said earlier about the whole storyline of Ultima 7, I found this detail about the character of Batlin rather neat, even though the Avatar would never know about it because casting Armageddon isn't considered canon. Lord British pretty much chastises you for being so stupid as to cast this spell, so naturally I shut him up and cut his head off with the Black Rock Sword. Then I sat on his throne for a little while pretending to be the new Lord British and got bored of that and went back to the Isle of Fire to paint the rest of my days away with only a demonic sword for company. Doing this makes the game unwinnable of course, at least until you reload a save. But this is just one of the many freedoms Ultimate 7 has, it's pretty eerie too walking through towns and dungeons after casting this spell. You really feel like you're the last man on Earth. Well, at least Batlin is still alive in this save. Rudium should be very careful who he sells his spell to, though to be fair, you have to have a pretty high level just to cast it and have the required gold to buy it, which isn't really reassuring. But after saving the world from the Guardian, an evil growing undead army in Scar Bray, and Exodus for the second time, it's time for the Avatar to earn a well-deserved rest in Ultima Underworld 2. The opening of that game has the Avatar invited to a feast at Lord British's castle to celebrate the reconstruction after the Fellowship did their dirty deeds on the land. I'm sure it'd be a good time and nothing would go wrong. <laughs>